Uh, my name is uh, William Zogby. I'm the president of the American College of Cardiology and also professor of medicine at uh, uh, Whale Cornell Medical College. Also hold the uh, William Winters Endowed Chair of Cardiovascular Imaging at the Methodist uh, DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center in Houston and Director of Cardiovascular Imaging Institute at the Methodist Hospital. So good morning to you all and thank you for coming. Uh, before we get started, uh, I'm sorry to announce that you probably heard also that the PREVAIL trial is not being presented this morning due to an embargo break. PREVAIL was removed from the opening showcase session and it will not be discussed in this press conference. In addition, I want to emphasize that the embargo was broken in email sent prematurely by Boston Scientific and it was not due to actions from the ACC nor the investigators. So this morning press conference is our, our presentation of a late uh, breaking trial, so that actually was the first one. And uh, we, in the next few minutes, we will be discussing, uh, you know, HPS, uh, the trial, the other trial that was uh, uh, presented today. The format is about uh, uh, five minutes of presentation, some discussions, and certainly enough for question answer to, uh, to be able to address uh, some of your uh, questions that you may have about the trial. So let me introduce uh, to you first Dr. Jane Armitage, who if you were there, you heard her wonderful talk. She is professor of clinical trials and epidemiology and honorary consultant in public health medicine at the University of Oxford. She will be talking about HPS2 Thrive, randomized comparison of extended release niacin Laropiprant 2 gram daily versus placebo in 25,673 patients at high risk of occlusive vascular events. Dr. Armitage. Thank you very much. So uh, we undertook a large randomized trial um, in six countries, uh, four four Scandinavian countries, the UK and China, and patients who were at high risk of vascular disease were screened and, estand and established on standard LDL-lowering therapy with statin-based therapy, so either simvastatin or simvastatin plus azetamide as background therapy, which uh, lowered their LDL very effectively so that their background treatment was, uh, was good and they were at target with a mean cholesterol of six, LDL cholesterol of 63 milligrams per deciliter. Before patients were randomized, all of them took the active ER niacin preparation plus loropoprant. Loropoprant is a drug that reduces the flushing, which is a common and troublesome side effect of niacin. Uh, so participants had to be able to tolerate this combination before they were randomized. And so 25,673 patients were randomized, all of whom who could, could tolerate it for two grams daily for at least a month. Patients were followed up for a median of 3.9 years. <coughs> uh, and the key findings are as follows. The primary endpoint for the study was major vascular events a composite endpoint of uh, coronary events, non-fatal heart attacks, uh, or death from coronary disease, S stroke, any stroke, either a, an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke, or any arterial revascularization, so either a cor coronary angioplasty or bypass surgery or um, a peripheral uh, procedure. So those were all counted together in a composite endpoint of major vascular events. And what we saw is that there was no significant reduction with the treatment on that primary event. So there were 13.7% of participants allocated placebo had at least one major vascular event. 13.2% um, of those on active ERNR syndroprant had one, one of those events. We did see the expected uh, small increase in HDL cholesterol with the ER niacin preparation and a decrease in LDL cholesterol, 
the increase in HDL was 6 milligrams per deciliter. The average decrease in the LDL was uh, 10 milligrams per deciliter. So these are quite small changes in lipids in comparison with what you get with statin therapy, for example. But we might have expected those to produce um, about 10 or 10 to 15 percent benefit, but we did not observe that. It was a 4 percent non-significant reduction in the risk of major vascular events. But the more striking finding from the study was that when we looked at all the other uh, serious adverse events, and this has a very specific uh, definition, so usually serious means serious enough to get into hospital or to make a person significantly unwell. And when we looked at all the other serious adverse events, we found that there was a significant excess among people who, took, who were allocated the ER nurse in preparation during the trial. The excess represented a 3% absolute excess, which means about 30 patients for every 1,000 who were treated had at least one of these, um, uh, one of these side effects. And these cross a range of different things, most of which are already well-recognized side effects of niacin. So among people with diabetes in the trial, and about one-third had diabetes, was an increased risk of problems with their glucose, their sugar control. Among the, there were 17,000 patients who didn't have diabetes at entry to the trial, but among those, there was a significant <coughs> increase of about 25% in the risk of developing diabetes among those people who took the ER niacin. There were also increased risks of gastrointestinal problems, so that's tummy problems, uh, so indigestion, peptic ulceration, and diarrhea particularly. Um, but again, serious enough to get people into hospital, so 1% absolute excess of those. Also of musculoskeletal effects, um, <coughs> and skin side effects, but two, two side effects were increased which have not been uh, routinely recognized as being due to niacin, one of which was an increased risk of infections. Now these are a wide range of different types of infections from chest infections to kidney type infections and infections in a variety of different sites in the body. Because this was such a large trial, the 20% increased risk of infections that we observed was highly statistically significant um, and, uh, and, and of note. The other um, side effect that we observed was an increased risk of bleeding. Uh, it was both bleeding into the gut, into the stomach, um, and also bleeding in the head, so in intracranial bleeding. There was an increased risk of hemorrhagic stroke, although there was a small decline in the risk of ischemic stroke, um, <coughs> and an increased risk of bleeding elsewhere. So when we looked to see whether there were any particular types of participants for whom the, the small benefits might outweigh these risks, we were not able to identify any particular group of patients who we felt that the benefit, any benefits from the reduction in the major vascular events would be outweighed by these adverse effects on a variety of different other um, systems. So the uh, glucose problems, the gastrointestinal problems, the skin problems, the bleeding and the infection. So this was a, a disappointing, disappointing result, but nevertheless is clear and um, a reliable result because it was a very large study with good, good follow-up. And in the light of these findings, we consider that the role of ER nurse in preparations for the prevention of cardiovascular disease needs to be reconsidered. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dr. Armitage. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Spencer King. I think Dr. Spencer King needs no introduction. He's past president of the college, certainly. Um, World-renowned cardiologist. And also we have uh, Dr. Christy Ballantyne, who is chair of cardiology at Baylor College of Medicine, uh, to give some comments. So Dr. King, first, some comments regarding uh, the trial. So, uh, yeah, I'm Spencer King. I'm from the St. Uh, Joseph's uh, Heart and Vascular Institute and Emory University. Uh, 
I, yeah, I think this is, a, you know, very interesting. It sort of uh, keeps nailing the nails in the coffin of Niacin, I guess. Uh, but one, th some of the questions that uh, I found uh, were already asked, but I'll re-ask re them. Is uh, these people were ex exceedingly well controlled with statins? It seems like most most of them, and uh, I, I'm, not, I'm unclear about whether there were people screened who were excluded because they did not achieve adequate uh, uh, LDL lowering. No, no patients were not. They, okay. So uh, if they um, were, if they were taking simvastatin and ezetimibe, um, and their managing doctor was happy with their level of cholesterol, then we aimed for that target, but we didn't exclude people with high cholesterol if their managing doctor was happy that okay. they Okay, because, I mean, it's true that there are people out there who don't get these uh, uh, beautiful uh, LDL lowering with uh, uh, 40 of simvastatin alone. I mean, they, they do okay. exist. Yeah. And so one of the questions that was raised earlier, what, what about people who have less good control of the LDL? Okay, are, are they... Are they benefited by uh, addition of other drugs? And I think that's, you know, is a, a reasonable a question to ask. Uh, I do say that uh, in my own practice, uh, as many of us, I think, uh, uh, patients with a low HDL is where we've been, you know, and, and metabolic syndrome type patients have been where we've been uh, pouring the niacin to them. Uh, one of the questions I had going into this, I didn't know the structure of the trial completely, was did you give enough? And they're given two grams which is, you know, a, a, a nice dose. So I think that was an excellent choice of the dose. It was not an inadequate dose there. But one thing about the side effects that I do think is interesting to reflect on is this whole story about uh, relative reduction in absolute. You, we've got massive numbers of patients in here. So when, when you say things like uh, hemorrhagic stroke was significantly reduced and, you know, was significantly increased in, in the in the in the treatment group, I've just done uh, reverse math. So if I'm talking to a patient, I say, well, if you took this, uh, if you took this uh, uh, standard dose, you had a 97% chance that you would not have a hemorrhagic stroke. But if you took this experimental uh, arm, you had a 96.8% chance that you would not have a stroke. So, you know, it's just always interesting to think about you know, it's a significant difference, but the numbers are so massive, it's two-tenths of one percent difference in absolute hemorrhagic stroke. Well, that's not good, but so I think those are just things to think about. But I, the, the, the real question I have is, uh, overall, is niacin just dead, along with all the other drugs to increase HDL? Uh, in, are, are there individual <laughs> patients where personalized medicine still plays a role. And I think you're going to find a huge debate among physicians about say, yeah, but look, this patient having recurrent events, I got, you know, I, I believe, you know, whatever I want to believe. And there are patients, for instance, the average HDL raising here is quite uh, modest. Uh, there are patients that we've seen in practice with much more dramatic increase in HDL, but when I think about it, what we do is we put them on niacin. We also uh, put them on a diet. We also have them lose weight. We also have them exercise, and we throw the book at them, and they have maybe you know a, a twenty uh, point increase of a, you know very uh, much more dramatic increase in their HDL. Are they benefited or not? I mean, you know, we you know I can't speak to all those kind of patients, but. Certainly, we're looking at, at the results of, of average results in a huge trial, which is, is very clear uh, that uh, in people who are controlled uh, with uh, uh, reasonably well controlled with their uh, statin therapy, that uh, you know this didn't add anything so to them and increased increased the side effects. I, I, but I'm a little, I'm not quite as. I mean, these are. It's not that uh, you know these people were. Uh, had horrible, you know, huge number of them had horrible things to happen to. It's huge numbers, and there were increased side effects. And uh, but, but I'm I'm wondering if we, if if the message we're taking away is that we've harmed a lot more people than than we really have. So before we take questions from, 
I'll, I'll translate this into a question to Dr. Amitaj, which is, is, is niacin dead? Or can you get from this very large patient population, you presented a lot of data this morning, is there a subset that conceivably with the higher LDL, and you showed some of these data, but I didn't see the outcome portion of these data. Uh, I may have missed it. But <coughs> were you able, within this subset of individuals who still had high LDL upon entry, were they benefited, one way or another? And I, I don't know if, uh, if that subset of the population was, was studied. And then we'll open up for a discussion, and certainly we can ask questions, too. Uh, there was a trend towards um, a greater benefit among the patients who entered the trial with higher LDL cholesterol uh, compared with the low LDL. Um, the absolute benefit in those uh, patients was still small. small in comparison with the amount of harm that was caused. Um, so we were not able to identify any subgroup of participants in whom the uh, benefits clearly outweighed the risks. So the absolute risk reduction that was uh, with LDL over 77 was about 2 percent, 1.6 percent? 1.5 percent. 1.5 percent. And I guess those are major events. So I, I think the question is, if you looked at that same subgroup, what is their, in fact, side effects? I mean, it would be worth looking at that and uh, for it. I mean, um, I don't think you've done it by that type of yeah, right, the same group of patients. We've done some limited investigation but can't find particular groups in whom you could predict that the side effects were going to occur. Um, and I think one needs to bear in mind that even though we did see that trend, it didn't meet statistical significance, you know, after correction for the number of uh, but, analyses but that we did. You, but yeah, so if, you if you're going to correct the number of analyses in terms of the heterogeneity, you need to correct for the number of analysis in terms of side effects, too, which wasn't corrected. So I, I think you, you've got to be consistent in terms of the corrections for it. Uh, I, just, I just, you know, I think there, the, it, there is the issue that the majority of people in this country have, who, are, who use NICE have LDLs over 70. And it's always, it's always been is that we've known it's not an easy drug to use, has lots of side effects. Uh, it's been known for a long time with that. What was thought was that this population with low HDLs would have benefit. And you've shown pretty conclusively that not only is there, you don't have benefit and you do have the risk and that uh, we were wrong. I mean, I think that's a practice changing part of this, that people uh, out there, low HDL, uh, regardless of the LDL, low HDL is, is where we've been piling on a lot of niacin and, and, and you're, you're, you're showing uh, sure. uh, what, what will, I think, change the attitudes about that among many people. Well, let's start taking questions from, from the press here. Go ahead, please. Hi, I'm uh, Peggy Peck with MedPage to 